Hi, okay, uh, my name is Hugo Bronstein and I'm a postdoc working for Christine Luscombe at the University of Washington. And the title of my talk is Externally Initiated Regio-Regular P3HT with Controlled Molecular Weight and Narrow Polydispersity. Okay, so I'm not going to give much of an introduction other than say that that's P3HT, which is poly 3 hexylthiophene and we've already seen it in both talks and it's probably the most widely used conjugated polymer in the field of organic photovoltaics. Um, again, we've seen it before, you get very good efficiency when you mix it with PCBM and also very good performance uh, when you use it in a transistor. But so as a synthetic chemist, what the three things we can control about this material which uh, have drastic effects on both the performance of uh, solar cells and transistors is the molecular weight, which is how many repeat units you have, so the value of this N. Um, and this controls the region regularity, which is how well these are linked in the same fashion, so whether you have the hexyl chain on the same side of the molecule. And finally, the other thing that we can also control is the polydispersity, which is the, the variation of the chain lengths within your sample. So in general, a PDR, which is the polydispersity index, if it's uh, one or smaller, around one, it means all the polymer chains will be very, very similar length. If you've got two or anything basically above one, it means you're getting a, a, a large range of, of polymer samples, polymer chain lengths in there. Okay, so we didn't actually make uh, invent the synthesis of this, but um, the best available synthesis at the moment to make P3HT was developed by Yokozawa about five years ago now. And um, what he took is this bromo iodo hexalthiophene unit, and you can uh, activate it with isopropyl magnesium chloride to make this Grignard thing. And then when you add in this nickel catalyst, which is nickel chloride, DPPP, and that's the structure of DPP, which is very important in the sense that without this, the reaction doesn't work very well, is you can make P3HT with incredibly high region regularity. In fact, the only thing that stops having 100% is the very first unit of it is coupled the other way around. Very low PDIs, so it's very well controlled. You can control the chain length depending on the nickel loading and your N groups are uniformly HBR. So this reaction works very, very well. The reason it works very well is because it goes through a chain growth polymerization mechanism. So I'm going to go through a little bit about how that actually works for people who aren't familiar with polymer chemistry. So what we want is a chain growth. That's what lets this reaction work well. So what we don't want is a step growth polymerization, which is how most conjugated polymers are made. The ones, the polymers that uh, uh, Aleph just talked about, that's the mechanism, mechanism these normally go about. So it's a very simplified cartoon. So if you've got these red blobs, the monomers in solution, when you throw in a catalyst, what it starts doing, it starts linking these randomly. So yeah, it's just, I'll just hop onto two molecules, uh, join them together, and then after this happens, it'll drop off back into solution, the catalyst, and then it'll start linking other random ones. As the reaction proceeds, you know, you start getting uh, oligomers, and eventually, when you get high enough conversion, or basically you use up all your monomer, you get these polymers. And what you can notice is that, you know, some of these two units, four units, six units. And so this, basically, this is what leads to a large PDI, so you've got a, a broad range of samples in there. And the second problem with this type of polymerization is that high molecular weights, can, you can only get them at very high conversion. So you need a reaction that works very, very well. 99% conversion is what's needed to get a, a good molecular weight for these reactions. So what we're more interested in is chain growth polymerization, which is how the Yokozawa makes his P3HD. So in this case, again, if we start off with our little cartoon, you've got this catalyst, which will, uh, you throw it in, it'll join two units together. And the big difference in this case is that after the first... Uh, the first uh, catalytic cycle, it doesn't, the, the catalyst doesn't fall off into solution, it kind of hops along and starts linking other polymer units along a chain. So it grows along, chain growth, carries on, until under certain conditions, it doesn't always work like this, you get nice little polymer chains, all the same molecular weight. Not quite like that, but, you know, <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> but when it works well, you do get very con good control of the molecular weight and narrow PDIs, which is what Yokozawa sees. So in terms of his actual reaction, so you've got this Grignard functional um, monomer. When you throw in the nickel chloride DPPP, you get two transmethylations and you, get, you form this kind of nickel uh, species. And this is where the step that's very much debated is you basically get this nickel hops along intramolecularly. It doesn't go back into solution. No one knows exactly how it does this at the moment, in my opinion and you get this species, which is your, your, uh, your, it's the initiating species of the polymerization that was made in situ. Once you've got this, then basically, this reacts with some more of that, and you get a polymer. And on workup, you get some very nice P3HD. Works brilliantly. The problem is that this species you make in situ. So if you want to, basically, 
do anything else with it, have some other different end group other than HBR, it's very, very difficult. So that's the problem is you can't initiate it from other sources. So our motivation is we want to look at other types of polymer architectures. So for instance, a polymer brush or a star-shaped polymer, which all these kind of things you, know, you could use as in, a, in a device. This might have beneficial properties in FET because of high crystallinity. And to be able to grow these things, uh, there's two ways of going about it. You can either make a polymer chain and attach it, make the polymer chain and attach it. That kind of chemistry is very difficult and tends to not work very well. What we'd want to do is basically start off with the surface and grow a polymer chain off it, or start off with a little core and grow a polymer chain off it. So that's what we tried to do. And the way we did that is we tried to go for a very simple synthesis that works very well. So we took chlorobenzene, you throw in some nickel tetracus triphenylphosphine, and you basically get this oxidatively added nickel complex. Um, we did a, some work with this to show that with this kind of complex, you can actually uh, polymerize P3HT. But in order to mimic the Yokozawa work and to get the, the catalyst that works best, if you simply throw on some, some DPPP, then make this uh, nickel complex here, which basically this is a, a, an analog of the initiating species that we saw before. And the way you monitor direction is by doing phosphorus NMR. As you can see, these two peaks, basically, this kind of NMR tells you about the different phosphorus environments you have. These two peaks correspond to the different phosphorus in different environments. And because it's all made, basically, you can, you can make, do this reaction just by throwing things in sequentially, you don't even need to uh, isolate it. These are your residual ligands that you basically, that's left over, that's what you're kicking off. You get a little bit of this uh, nickel DPPP, which is from residual nickel in the solution, but it's, it, it, if you want, it can be purified and isolated. So, once we've made this uh, nickel species, you add it to 50 equivalents, how much you want, as long as not too much, because then you get precipitation of the polymer chain of the green yellow function of the monomer, and you quench with acid, and you get this nice P3HT polymer. So what we did, we uh, characterized it by GPC, which this time, we basically put it through a column. It tells you effectively the, the molecular weight and also the length of time it takes to come out tells you the polydispersity. So we, we saw a very nice polydispersity of 1.1, which is as low as Yokozawa sees, and a molecular weight that corresponds well to the number of equivalents we added. To confirm that we basically, you know, you know, we were initiating from this phenol group, you can do moldy time of flight, which uh, looks at your um, actual individual polymer chains, looks at the molecular weight of them. And you can see from this we've got about 95% phenyl initiated with H terminated, which is exactly what we want. So we've got very good control of the end groups and of the polydispersity as we saw. So 95% of that, and then we've got a small amount of this uh, BR terminated, which is slightly undesirable, uh, about 1% of HH terminated P3HT, which again isn't too much of a problem, it's, it's going pretty well. Again, to confirm the reaction is going via a chain growth mechanism and just to make sure it's basically that we're, we're initiating and then we're going into the Yokozawa regime of, of uh, the polymerization mechanism, you take aliquots of the reaction as it's going out. So you basically take one out as the reaction goes out and work, uh, quench it and then analyze it. And the important thing to note is that this line, which is your molecular weight as determined by GPC and your percentage conversion of monomer is linear. Um, the other thing to note is that the polydispersity, which is this number here, that stays low throughout. And these two things in combination are telling you, yes, the reaction is going through chain growth. So um, this works very well. However, in order to make these kind of new polymer architectures that we're interested in, you need some degree of functionality. And so the next thing we tried was making the same complex with an ortho total group. Fine, it's not quite a star-shaped polymer yet, but... So you can do the same. This is just as easy to make as the other one. In fact, we find it actually works, works even better. In this case, you get 100% pure initiation. There's no, there's no side reaction side products again. A very low PDI, and also you get uh, a, a nice molecular weight which corresponds well with your feed ratio. Um, and we published these results last year. And that leads me to thank um, uh, some conclusions, which is we made, um, developed a new way of initiating the synthesis of P3HD because we've very good control of the end groups, uh, good control of the molecular weight and polydispersity, and we've started to be able to tolerate some functionality on these initiating groups. So what we're working on currently is trying to make you know, surfaces with these kind of initiating groups on, which we're going to do the same chemistry on, star-shaped ones as well, dive block copolymers, and that kind of thing. I need to thank my boss, Christine Luscombe, all the members of my group, uh, DARPA Young Faculty Award and the SFCC who paid my salary, and you for your attention. So.